Good morning, church. Come on, would you stand to your feet? Sing this with us. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in his blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom.
Church, are you doing good? <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, we're so glad that you joined us this weekend, that you came to worship with us. I mean, every single time that God's people are together, it's something you don't want to miss out on because God's here when we gather. But you know, as I was thinking about this weekend, there's so many times that I can come into worship and it's so easy for me to just sing the songs and to just sing the words without really connecting with Jesus. And I mean, that's why we're here, right? I don't know about you, but I don't wanna just sing songs. I don't wanna just put on another service. We're here to meet with God. That's why we sing, that's why we gather. And so before we continue, we're just gonna take a moment to just get still to get silent, to quiet our hearts and put our focus back on Jesus again. So if it helps you to even close your eyes, I wanna encourage you to do that. But just grab a hold of any thoughts right now that are just swimming through your head and just put them to the side right now. All the distractions just push them away just for a moment so that we can focus in on the Lord again. And I'm going to just read a scripture from Psalm 145. And as I do, I just want you to just let the truth of God's word just wash over you again. Wash over your mind. Wash over your heart. So this is from Psalm 40, 145. This is what it says. I will exalt you my God and King and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. For great is the Lord and he is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue and I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness for the Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. It was my cross you bore so I could live in the free the 
Yes, God, worthy is your name. Lord, you are the reason we are here. To you belongs all the glory. To you belongs all our love, Jesus. Caught up in your presence, I just want to sit here at your feet. Caught up in this holy just gone through the motions I'm sorry when I've just sang another song take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry when I've come I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. Caught up in your presence. I just want to see. Yeah. 
will do No one else will do Only you satisfy Caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet Caught up in this holy Jesus, that's our, that's our heart today. We just want you. Nothing else, just you, Jesus. I pray you'd remind us again today that it is you and you alone who can satisfy our hearts. It's not you plus a nicer car. It's not you plus a new home. It's not you plus another person. It's, it's you and you alone who can satisfy our hearts. So we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you not only forgive us of our sin, but you can set us free from the power of our sin, Jesus. We love you and we worship you in this place and we pray that you would continue to speak to us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Hey, thanks so much for worshiping. You can go ahead and grab a seat. Welcome to Northwoods. If I haven't met you, my name is John. I'm one of the pastors here and it is great to have you with us this weekend, whether you're in the room or whether you are watching online. Always great to be together on the weekend. Well, hey, at this time, I'm gonna invite the ushers forward to receive today's offering. And as they come forward, I wanna invite everyone back next weekend as Pastor Cal will be continuing in our Kingdom Surge series. And as I've been looking ahead and thinking about next weekend, I was reminded of a time in college when I swapped cars with the dean of our school so I could go fishing. He had this old junky truck, it was beat up, and the gas gauge on this thing didn't even work, all right? So I took his truck, I gave him my car, my car I drove around consistently on empty because I was a broke college student. Never put more than about five bucks at a time in that car. So I gave him my car, I took his truck out fishing. Later that day, I brought his truck back, and as I was driving back, it was one of those times where I felt the Lord speaking in my heart, hey John, replace the gas you just used in his truck. And I remember thinking, well, God, hold up. Number one, you know I don't have a lot of money and my car's on empty right now. And number two, his gas gauge is broken. He won't ever know if I put gas in it anyways. But I learned a long time ago, if you win an argument with God, that means you lose. So I pulled over, I put about 10, 15 bucks in his truck and I, I dropped the truck back off to him. And as we switched keys, I thanked him. And as I was walking down to my car, I remember thinking, that's 10 or 15 bucks that I will never see again, and I needed that to fill my car up. And I get in my car, and I put the key in it, and I turn it on, and I watched as the gas gauge went from empty to full, right there in front of my eyes. I remember it was actually, it almost startled me, because I was like, what just happened? Now obviously the dean put gas in my car, but in that moment, it was as if the Lord was trying to teach me, John, when you're obedient with the resources I've given you, I will always take care of your needs and you cannot outgive me. And that's the heart of where we're headed next weekend, that when each of us are obedient with the resources that God has given us and releasing them to God, he will always take care of our needs and we cannot outgive him. So hope you'll join us next weekend as we continue in our Kingdom Surge series. Now, next month, we have something coming up that's a pretty big deal around here. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, but before I do, go ahead and check out the side screens. Christmas time is almost here. Experience the wonder of Christmas at Northwoods Church. A musical production for the whole family. 11 shows, December 15th through the 22nd. 
Grab your friends and family and get your free tickets online at Northwoods.Christmas. So the Christmas production is coming up in the next month here, and you can get tickets online, just like it said up there, at Northwoods.Christmas. That's going to be the place you can get tickets now. We will have a few hard copies available here for each of the production services available outside in the lobby. There's a booth out there that has a red ticket sign. So if you don't have avail- uh, availability to somehow get those online, you can get some out in the lobby after the service. But the easiest place to get them will be online at Northwoods.Christmas. Now, as we head into the production, let's just focus again on the why behind the what. The what is the Christmas production, but why do we do this every year? And I think that's simple because we are a people here at Northwoods who have a heart for people that are far from God. We wanna, come, we wanna see people come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and experience complete freedom. And so as we head into the Christmas production, I want you to be thinking about and praying about two things. The first is this. Every year we have the Christmas production, it takes lots and lots of people filling lots and lots of different roles to pull it off. And so we have all kinds of roles that need filled if we're gonna pull this thing off. And so I want you to be thinking about, is there a time during that Christmas production that you can give to serving in one of those roles? And you can find out what those roles are at northwoods.church slash Christmas serve. So be thinking about that. And then number two is this, be thinking about and praying about who are those people that are close to you but far from God that you can be inviting to the Christmas production this year? So be thinking about and praying about those two things, and we're gonna be expecting at what God is going to do at the Christmas production this year. So hey, thanks again for being here. Let's prepare our hearts for to hear a word from our senior pastor. How's everybody today? Doing good? You, uh, you pray for me. I'm uh, getting my bass voice on for the Christmas production. Got a little junk going on. But if it doesn't hurt you, it's not hurting me, all right? I just got to push a little harder today. But listen, it's great to have you with us. Great to have those of you uh, watching uh, online as well, our online family, all of our other campuses. And before I get going today, there's a little family business that we need to take uh, care of today. You know, during a series in which we're asking God to help us plant 3,000 churches worldwide and 20 regional churches by 2030, it's not lost on me that 30 years ago, this next March, we're getting ready to do a big 30-year celebration, already planning it, but 30 years ago, this next March, we ourselves were a church plant. You realize that? Consequently, we're here today because a group of believers had a vision for a new church in Peoria. That initial vision came through John and Susie Cheney. In July of 1989, John joined the staff of Grace Church in Morton, Illinois with the goal of launching a new church sometime in 1990. And so by the time I was called to be the senior pastor in February of 1990, they couldn't find anybody else, so they asked me, Uh, John had already been laying the foundation for this new plant for eight months. So we then worked together over the next month as I brought specific nuance to the vision and on March 25th of 1990, we opened the doors. Now while John has served this church in various capacities over the past 30 years, uh, it's the last 10 years that he has been a valued staff member in the small group spiritual growth arena. He's, he oversaw the startup and development of the Alpha course, which probably a lot of you guys have taken. He's one of the most entrepreneurial guys I've ever known. I could always say, hey John, can we make this happen? He'll make it happen, or at least he'll try, you know? And uh, he has always dreamed big and believed God to help him accomplish whatever was in his heart. Uh, but today, 
He is the first person to officially retire from our Northwood staff. We've never had that happen before. And uh, that will be taking place the end of December 2019. Uh, John and Susie have already purchased a motor home and they plan to spend time visiting their kids all over the United States. But today, I want you to honor this special couple. And so as they come to the stage, will you thank God for their service? Come on, everybody, get on your feet. Thank God for how he used John and Susie. Yeah. Come on, I can't hear you. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Stay standing because we're going to pray for them. But you know, I, I, I want you to understand this. I've been in churches before where you're never supposed to applaud for somebody because that's glorifying them. No, 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 no. All the glory goes to God. But you know, Philippians 2.29 actually says, you honor special servants of God. And that's what we're doing today. They've given their lives to serving Jesus. And John let us know it's not gonna end as he's, as he's out there in his uh, motor home. Everywhere they go, people are gonna be hearing about Jesus because that's just who they are. Now, at each of the services, we've also given them some little knickknacks for their motor home. You wanna bless them, find something that goes with the motor home, right? And this one really has something cool in it because we've been giving them gas cards, you know, to fill up the van and all that, or to fill up the, uh, and those take a little bit to fill up. But this deal here is your National Park and Federal Recreation Land Pass. So everywhere you go in the country, the two of you get to go free. Is that awesome? Now listen, after the service today, uh, we're gonna have some refreshments in the student center. So just hang around, go in there, bless them, thank them. Enjoy a little refreshments together. But right now, I want you to stretch forth your hand towards uh, John and Susie, and together we're gonna thank the Lord for them. Father, we thank you today for this special couple. I thank you for the vision you put in their hearts 30 years ago, Lord, and then you called them to step out. Anybody that's tried to plant a church knows that's not the easiest thing to do, Lord, but it was your vision, and we're grateful that you used John and Susie to lay the foundation for that. Again, I just remember the very first night I met John, as we talked about what this church was gonna be like, we just, our hearts were just knit. And we're grateful, Lord, that we had the opportunity to do this, this together. Thank you, Lord, for how you've used them. Thank you for the special gift they've been to this church. And we pray now, Lord, as they enter into this next chapter, Father, it will just be filled, not only with rich fellowship with you and with their family, but God, everywhere they go, open doors that they may have the opportunity of introducing other people to Jesus Christ. We just bless them, we honor them as special servants, and we give you thanks for them today. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone agreed with this prayer? Said amen. 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 God bless you guys, thank them again. Thank you, Susie. God bless you. <clears throat> amen, thank you guys. Again, stop by the uh, Student Center and enjoy some time with them. Uh, afterwards. Well, we're at part two today of our series Kingdom Surge, where we're talking about five key factors to igniting our future. Last weekend, we talked about the passion surge and aligning our hearts with God's vision to reach the nations with the gospel and planting life transforming churches wherever you go. Now, guys, when we get on the same page with him, and listen to how I said that, it's more important that we be on the same page with him rather than trying to get him on our page, right? We're on his page. As we care about what he cares about, then, guys, we can expect him to do amazing things in turning that vision into reality. So first is the passion surge. He, he gets a hold of our heart about something he wants done, that he cares about. And then because we care about it, that leads to the power surge, which we're talking about today. That is we start to pray about what he cares about and then he releases his power. That's factor number two. Guys, we need God's power and prayer is the key to such power. 
Look at what happened when the early church prayed. They had begun to experience threats, persecution. They prayed in Acts chapter 4, verses 29 and 30. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Then look at verse 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. Wow. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. You talk about a power surge. Wouldn't that be a cool thing? If on some Sunday morning after we all said amen, the building went and God's letting you know he's heard, that's pretty cool. But listen, whether we ever feel the building shake or not, the fact is our kingdom surge vision demands a power surge vitality and the key to that surge is prayer. Prayer is the key to spiritual power. I have a a book in my office which I have long treasured. It was first written in 1904 by an old saint named S.D. Gordon. It's entitled Quiet Talks on Prayer. And in the very first chapter, he writes that there's only one inlet of power to a believer's life, and that's the Holy Spirit. That's true for every one of us. There's only one inlet of power. But there are five outlets. And he goes on to talk about those outlets. First is your life, who you are. Second is your your lips, what you say. The third outlet of power is your service, what you do. The fourth outlet is your money, what you turn loose for the kingdom of God instead of spending on yourself. The fifth outlet is prayer, what we claim in Jesus' name. And then he writes, by all odds, the greatest of these is the outlet through prayer. He says the greatest thing anyone can do for God and for man is to pray. It's not the only thing, but it's the chief thing. And then he pens one of my favorite quotes on prayer. Listen to this. The great people of the world today are the people who pray. I do not mean those who talk about prayer nor those who say they believe in prayer, nor yet those who can explain about prayer, but I mean those people who take time and pray. They don't have the time. It must be taken from something else. This something else is important, very important and pressing, but still less important and less pressing than prayer. There are people that put prayer first and group the other items in life schedule around and after Prayer. And S.D. Gordon says, these are the great people in the world today. Are you one of them? See, the good news is that that kind of greatness is within reach of every one of us. You always wanted to be great? Why not start here? And be great for the kingdom of God through your prayer life. But as we talk about the kingdom surge and planting churches all around the world, the most important thing we can do corporately and individually is to pray for a release of God's power that will advance the gospel and open doors all around the world. And incidentally, this week, we went into our 48th country as we planted a church in the Philippines. Anybody care to give God praise for that? 48 countries. It's awesome. So we're in the Philippines. Now, in a few weeks, I'm going to ask you to consider making a 2020 faith pledge. Three weeks from now. A pledge will be over and above your regular giving to help take this church planning surge to a new level. But even if for whatever reason, because there's no pressure, guys, we either get rid of the debt or we don't. I mean, we're not, it's not like we're building something and boy, we're going to put the shovels in the ground and we don't have the $5 million. This is just a win-win. 
We get rid of the debt faster this way and it releases the surge. But I don't want anybody to feel compulsion on this. I want you to be praying. And what I'm saying to you is that even if for whatever reason you can't give something over and above, you can pray at a different level. And if you'll do that, you'll make a huge difference in this kingdom surge. So I wanna talk about four levels of prayer today and I wanna help you go to a new level in your prayer life as we seek God for a power surge. Understand, first of all, that the word prayer refers to any and every form of interaction with God. That's what prayer is, interaction with God. It's the catch-all term, prayer. But the Bible then uses different words for different forms of prayer. For example, when I thank God for something, that's prayer. But it's a form of prayer called thanksgiving. When I'm sitting in God's presence and just loving on him and thanking him for being a wonderful father, praising him for his attributes, for his wisdom, his kindness, his love, whatever, that, that's prayer. But it's a form of prayer called adoration. When I start praying for my own needs, asking God to meet my needs, that's prayer, but it's a form of prayer called petition. Okay? So prayer covers it all, but there are different forms. Or what I'm going to call today levels of interaction with God. And I want you to see them as an ascending staircase. And I wanna help you progress from one level to the next today. Now, another important caveat before we start is this. Don't think of any level as more important than another. So we're gonna start here at level one, and we're gonna come up here to level two, but what I want you to understand is that level one is always foundational and supportive to the next level. As I go to level three, then level one and two are, see, I'm never, I'm never leaving the level behind and saying it's unimportant. It informs and shapes every other level on up. Do you understand? And so I wanna give you these, these four levels. Here's, here's the deal. If you stay at level one and never move up to other levels, you'll never access and release the further dimensions of power that are available to you. And so I wanna talk about these four levels. Foundational to everything else is level one, and that is what we call communion. This is just the place of fellowship and friendship with God, like we sang this morning. I, I'm not here for anything. I just wanna be in your presence. I just want to love you. I just want to praise you for who you are. This is communion with God. All prayer starts here. And if you're gonna know fellowship and friendship with God, then you have to be on right terms with him. What do I mean by right terms? There are some objective terms and there are some subjective terms when it comes to our prayer life. So if you're gonna know communion, fellowship, friendship with God, you first of all have gotten to, you need to have come to him, into relationship with him through Jesus Christ. You have a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says if you don't, then you're still separated from God. Yes, you can talk to him. Yes, he'll hear you. Yes, he may still answer some of your prayers because he loves you, but at the end of the day, you're not in a relationship of friendship with him. You don't belong to his family yet until you give your life to Jesus. It also means, as I'm communing here, that I'm trusting the shed blood of Jesus Christ to have removed my sins and given me a righteousness that allows me to come before the Father. And then two, I know objectively that the Holy Spirit is in my life 
and I have been adopted into the family. I'm a son, I'm a daughter, and the Holy Spirit's crying out, Abba, Father, Papa. See, that's, that's the objective reality that we need to have when we're in communion with the Father. And then there are some subjective realities so that nothing will hinder my prayers, even though I may be objectively in relationship with him. If I am walking in sin, and I'm just hiding secret things in my life that he's been speaking to me about, but I don't want to deal with them, listen, that will hinder your prayer. You'll have a distance with him. You'll know self-condemnation and shame rather than walking in the freedom that he wants you to know. Secondly, you want to be walking in a place of humility and obedience to him. You're going to come and commune with him, and you're going to go on up to some other levels. Very, very important that you be walking in obedience and humility before him. I would say as well, another very important subjective element that could hinder our prayers is that we not be carrying resentment and bitterness around. That's why forgiveness is so important. So I'm not sitting here talking to God about things, and the whole time my heart is not in the right place because I'm not obeying him. I'm carrying around bitterness, see? The communion level is all about enjoying the Father. Just being with him. And out of that, he's gonna speak into your life about some other things that he wants you to pray for and take you to other levels where he releases power. The picture of communion came to mind when one of our staff who loves to hunt, was talking about his recent expedition with two of his sons, and he said, it's so much more fun to hunt with my sons than to just sit out there in a tree by myself. Now you understand, they're sitting in different trees, in silence, for hours, but they're with each other. Now I know some of you ladies might find that hard to believe. I was joking with him, I said, only guys can sit in trees and say nothing for hours, and when, when asked how it went, say, man, it was great, best talk we've had in years. <laughs> right? Now, I know that may sound funny, but that is what communion with God is like. You don't have to be talking. You're just enjoying being with him. You know he's there, and it's... It's like there's this silent language going on all day. Lord, you're so awesome. I just love you. Thank you that you're here with me. And at this level, you're not asking for anything. You simply want to be with him, enjoying him, loving him, thinking about him, worshiping him, grateful that whether you're sitting in a tree, sitting at a desk, driving your car, reading the paper, working around the kitchen, no matter what, he's there, and your consciousness of his presence makes life so much better than if you were simply doing life alone. So this level, as I said, is foundational to the Christian life, and it informs, it undergirds, and it shapes every other level of prayer. Yet while it's foundational, it's not the only level, because, you see, it concerns only God and myself. As S.D. Gordon says, its influence is directly subjective. It affects only you. And while God wants to commune with you and have sweet fellowship with you, he wants to use your prayer life to affect more than just you. And that leads to level two. So at level one, I'm communing with him. At level two, I go up a step. This level is known as petition. And I'm using that word in its most narrow form. Petition means I'm asking for something for myself. God is totally okay with you as you commune with him to give him your needs. He invites you to do that. So lest you feel, and I've heard hundreds of believers, by the lie of the enemy, you know you're being selfish if you pray for something for yourself. Well, I can have wrong motives. I can have selfish motives. But listen, when I bring my needs to God, I'm doing exactly what Jesus taught me to do in that famous prayer, the Lord's Prayer, when he said, give us this day our daily bread. He went on in Luke 11 and verse 9 in something of a commentary on the Lord's Prayer. 
He says, well, I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. The point is you have needs and you need to ask God to meet them. And one of the ways, listen to me, one of the ways God wants to grow your faith is by responding in specific ways to specific requests that you lift up to him. And I'm telling you, when you see that happen, your faith grows. It doesn't stay the same place. I'm so grateful that he began to shape me in my prayer life way back even before I went into the ministry. I remember sitting at the kitchen table one night and uh, I had answered God's call to go into ministry and preach the gospel, but I knew I was gonna have to go to college on my own. My 10 kids, my dad made not all that much money and there was no money for sending me. I didn't have money saved up. I had a little job that kept gas in the car and that was about it. So I'm sitting at the table on a Saturday night and I have three colleges that I'm gonna send my ACT scores to and I need $7.50 to send my ACT scores. I know that doesn't sound like much, but in 1977, that's probably like 30 some dollars today. I didn't just have $30 sitting around. And I remember sitting at the table and my petition sounded something like this. Lord, I have no idea how I'm supposed to go to college when I don't even have the money to send in my 750. That was on Saturday night. Monday morning, a man named Mr. Winsler came to me at school. He was the guidance counselor, and I had been a part of a new counseling program that high schools were starting up to, to work with your peers in counseling and this type of thing. And on that Saturday, we had gone to Bowling Green State University to talk about this, this new program. And there was three students along with Mr. Winsler. I was one of the students. He came to me on Monday after I had told God on Saturday night, where am I gonna get the 750? And you, it just about dropped me in the hallway when Mr. Winsler said, Cal, I had no idea that Bowling Green was gonna pay us for coming down there for the presentation, but they gave us $30. And he said, the only fair way I know to distribute it is to divide it among the four of us who went. Now I want you, if you're good math, all right, take your 30, divide by four, you tell me, what is that? 750, and my ACT scores got sent in on that Monday. Huh? I'll take God in some of those little ones. He taught me to trust him in my $7.50 needs. And then the bigger ones came. So now, a few months later, I'm ready to, okay, I need to go to the Bible college. Now I'm ready to send in my registration. Where am I get the $25? Don't have it. God, what do you want me to do? I'm praying that at the time we get back, late April, late track meet one night, nine o'clock, I'm coming out of the locker room, I can still see the light kind of shining on my car out there, but I can tell shadow of a man standing next to my car as I walked up there, stuck out his hand, I shook his hand, and he said, I'm Jeff Ling from Fort Wayne Bible College, and I just stopped by tonight to find out whether you'd made a decision to come to the Bible College yet or not. Well, I'd made my decision to go to the Bible College, but I didn't want to tell him the only reason I haven't sent in my registration is because I don't have the money. And his next words were, by the way, if you've made that decision, go ahead and send in your registration because the $25 is already in there for you. Praise God, he taught me at the 750 level. He taught me at the $25 level. I told you last week about the five or six times I went to my uh, mailbox while at school, needing money to keep me in school and receive five or six times the $500 that I could walk up to the third floor and keep me in school. Some of you know the story. These are all part of our little storybook of how God has provided over the years. Susan and I were just a, in our very first pastorate, young pastors. We don't have much. We're not being paid much. Uh, we now have two little ones. We're driving a two-door Plymouth Champ with the baby seats in the back. You have to put the seats up to get them back there, right, and all that type of thing. 124000 on that car. At the same time, we're giving 20% of our income to the church. We're tithing, but now we're building a nursery, and we wanted to be able to give over and above. And one day I began to calculate, and I thought, you know what? 
We just need to back down from the 20%, keep tithing, but I think I need to start saving for a car. I talked to Susan about that, and can you believe that young lady resisted me? She said, no, I don't feel led to do that. I think we need to start, keep giving as much as we can. And then I got real smart with her, and I said, well, I hope you have a plan, because cars don't grow on trees, you know? Well, I think we need to pray about it. I was a lump. It, you know, sometimes you're, you're standing here praying about it, going like, yeah, right. Huh? Right at that moment, she comes to my office like a day later, tears rolling down her cheeks, said, you need to read this letter. I pulled the letter out. I'll never forget how it started. Some people are called to the front lines of ministry and others are called to support those who are on the front lines of ministry and for whatever whatever reason, God put you and your wife on the hearts of me and my wife, and so we wanted to send you this check for your next car. This was not somebody in our church. We hadn't talked with anybody about what we were praying for. 70 miles away, God put on somebody's heart a check. I opened that thing up, $5,000. Yeah, you can give the Lord praise for that. 750 needs, $25 needs. $500 needs, $5,000 needs. And I've told you before about the time that we're saying, Lord, do you really want us? Can we build a new house? Would you provide? And, and we're trying to cobble together everything we have. And is it reasonable and this and that? And right at that moment, we get a $25,000 check from somebody who out of the blue said, I want to help you uh, buy the land for the house. Guys, I know whereof I speak when I talk about the fact that I have seen God answer prayer directly, direct answers to direct petitions. And no, not every time have I received miraculous answers, but here's what I'm telling you. If you will commune with God, and out of that communion with him, you'll continue to be obedient in whatever he has asked you to do, and you will lift up your needs, there are going to be times, listen, when he brings you to a need that you have no earthly power to change and he's brought you there because he wants you to ask so that he can show you his goodness and take your faith to another level. And every believer in this place, he wants to help you develop your storybook of when you had a need and you ask and he answered and your faith went to another level, amen? That's our good God. He wants to answer your prayer and his petition that does that. You know, he's the one who says ask. James chapter four and verse two says, you do not have because you don't ask God. Now it goes on to say that sometimes even when you ask, if your motive is wrong, God's not gonna answer that. He'll help you reshape your prayer. But I decided a long time ago, if I'm doing without something that I feel is a legitimate need, is not gonna be because I didn't ask God. And yet there's all kinds of believers that by the lie of the enemy, well, I'm being selfish. Had a young lady that I used to love to see here at church. She was an usher for us and until she went home to be with Jesus a few years ago. And I hadn't seen her for quite some time and and then one Sunday, she showed up, gave her a big hug, joked with her a little bit, said, what did I do to make you mad? Why, you've been staying away. And she then told me about a rather embarrassing health issue she had that keeps her from leaving her home. And I said, well, have you ever received healing prayer for that? And I'll never forget her answer. She said, no, no, I always felt that it was selfish of me to ask God for healing since there are lots of people with far worse problems than me. Don't raise your hand. You ever said that one? Because I want to stop there and, and, and I want to challenge you to send that lie right back to the pit of hell from whence it came. A lie that's designed to keep you from going after what you need so that God can release his power in your life. Lie number one, you're being selfish if you ask. No, the Bible tells me to ask so that God can grow my faith in meeting that need. So you quote the verses back to the enemy when he tells you you're being selfish. No, 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 no. You have not because you've asked not. 
I'm invited to come and ask, right? Lie number two. Well, because someone else has a worse problem, yours isn't important. You ever heard that one? I say, oh, really? Here's what I want you to know. If it matters to you, it matters to God. And his invitation to you, no matter what, he doesn't say, well, now, size up your issues compared to somebody else's and decide whether they're important enough to bring to me. That's not what your father says. Here's what he says. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I stood right here, most everybody had left. I stood right back up there in the aisle, laid my hands on her, invited the Holy Spirit to come and move in her life to go to and through that issue. I bound it in Jesus' name, rebuked it in Jesus' name, rebuked the enemy's work in Jesus' name, and invited a healing over her and blessed her and sent her away. And the next day, she, next week, she came back fairly dancing. She says, God has healed me. Wow. And I'm telling you that until the day of her death, she never again struggled with that issue that kept her from being here, that was hindering her service to the Lord or keeping her from her desire to be here at church. And here's what I'm saying, guys. She almost missed out due to believing the enemy's lie. Listen, your whole life is utterly dependent upon the outstretched giving hand of God. Everything we need comes from him. Our friendships, our ability to make money, our health, our financial needs, strength in temptation, comfort in sorrow, guidance in difficult situations, help of all sorts. As I said, our financial needs, our bodily needs, our mental and emotional needs, our spiritual needs, all come from God and necessitate a constant touch from him. Thus, there needs to be a constant stream of petition going up and a constant stream of supply coming down. So start with communion, and out of that, move to the next level, because this is a faith-building level where you talk to God about your needs and invite him to meet them. But don't stay there. There's another level through which he wants to release power, and that's the next step up, and that's intercession. Again, it's founded in communion with God, there's petition where he meets our needs. Level number three is intercession. And here is where I stand in the gap for other people and invite God's power to touch their lives. Now, because I need help in remembering, and I like, I, I, when I tell you I'm praying for you, I'm generally gonna put you in my book. This is book number two this year because somebody stole the first book. It's out in Portland. I hope he's using it to pray. I want you to know I stood in the gap for some of you this week. And I believe there's power released. As I commune with God, I want, Lord, how do you want me to pray for some of these things? And so I lifted up Leanne and the bodily situation that she's struggling with right now, asking God for his healing. And then I lifted up Vern Ask God to wipe out that cancer, to give him strength. I prayed for a young couple that's been struggling in their marriage and asking God to help them fight back to a place of health. I lifted up Renee, a young lady that's just begun to walk in freedom, that she would continue to walk there. I lifted up Betty, that she'd continue to walk in her freedom and be able to overcome some of the financial issues that have come against her. On and on and on. I put them in the back of my book. Young lady that come down who's now in my book because last night she told me I'm supposed to sing in the production and, and I don't have a voice. And then I lift up this church. 
I've begun praying for the Christmas production. I want you to join me, guys. Man, the eternities of people are gonna be at stake. I said, Lord, would you allow us through the 11 service to touch 28,000 people this year? And I know that a great evangelistic response would be like 5% of all that. I mean, even Billy Graham didn't see 5% all the time. 5%, 1,400 people would say yes to Jesus. And see, I know I'm praying God's heart. He can be here pleading and bleeding over people who need Jesus. And he's saying, church, come before me, lift it up so that my power will be released and obstacles removed and so that people will come to Christ. And then I brought before him, oh God, would you allow us Lord, would you give us that 2.5 million over and above our budget next year so that we can just release this surge and see so many more churches planted? And God, you know, we've, we've really kind of fallen off here at the end of 2019 and everything is based upon our really doing well in the, the budget. So God, we need a great year-end giving. You know, I'm just, I'm just lifting up things to the Lord like this because I know that when I pray, but man, man if we can unite our hearts, we're gonna see a surge of power. There really is nothing more important that we can do, guys, than lift up our voices together as a church. And so today, before you out the door, I'm gonna give you a 21-day Kingdom Surge prayer challenge that for the, the next three weeks, I've got one thing on there each time. Those of you at, the other church, at our other campuses, there'll be an, some specific things related to you that your campus pastor will tell you about. But each day, we, we just think of several thousand of us lifting up these needs before God. I'm telling you, there's gonna be a power surge if we'll come into his presence. One of the reasons I'm delighted to be a part of the surge movement is because it's led by one of the greatest men of God of our generation, in my estimation, Larry Stockstill. You talk about someone who knows how to pray. Everything that Larry's doing, why these churches are going all over the world, is because it's bathed in prayer. He was actually mentored in prayer by the pastor of the largest church in the world, David Yongi Cho, who just has this small church of 850,000 in Seoul, Korea. And if you went to Seoul, Korea today, you would see that they have this prayer mountain where 24 seven, there are thousands of people out there in that mountain praying around the clock. I go, is it any wonder? They've seen what they've seen. Yongi Cho, they, they, they pray every Friday night. They pray all night as a church. Yongi Cho said he would come to our, come to the U.S. for our church growth conferences. And he said he would learn all about our strategies and this and that. He says, but I was always shocked because there was never anything about prayer. He said the only strategy I knew was prayer. Larry Stock still does a message on the seven spiritual fathers in his life. David Yongi Cho is one of them who taught him how to pray. And Larry's heart, not only through this surge, but now is to father and mentor young pastors. And guys, I couldn't be more thrilled that he has selected 40 pastors for the next year to come sit at his feet once a quarter. And both my son Jonathan and Nathan have been selected to be a part of that. They're gonna get more than a PhD. But I want you to watch um, Larry and then uh, Ben DeBale, who's kind of the operations director, sent us a fresh word this week. Just uh, take note of this uh, video. Hello, Pastor Cal and all of the believers there at Northwoods Church. Do you realize what an integral part you are in Surge? We are just planting so many churches from the believers right there in your local church. I love the verse in 2 Corinthians 9. It says, he has scattered abroad. His righteousness endures forever. Truly, your church is scattering the seed of the word of God abroad in so many nations across the earth, and it says your righteousness will endure forever. Could I challenge you to make 2020 your greatest year of investing in the kingdom of God and building a legacy? 
That generosity factor is what God loves and he will supply seed as you've never seen in 2020. Believe him for it. Let's step forward together into a new decade. Hey, Northwoods, you just heard from Larry Stockstill, the founder of The Surge Project. My name is Ben. I help to oversee the day-to-day operations of Surge. I've been up there many times with our Northwoods family. I just want to reiterate what Pastor Larry said. Thank you so much for partnering with us in just the short while that you've been a Surge Project partner. Y'all have planted hundreds, literally hundreds of churches all around the world. In every single country we've had an available planter in, you guys have planted in. And the numbers are gonna be astronomical as these churches continue just to grow and and build their congregations. It's gonna come to a point where there's gonna be more people meeting in Surge churches that Northwoods has helped plant than are even worshiping on the weekends there in the Northwoods campuses, which is a really incredible thing. And while the numbers are gonna be big, every single number represents an individual. And I think of the pastors that you've helped to fund and resource, one being Pastor Daniel, who I recently met in Brazil, who is planting a church on the outskirts in the rural places of San Paulo, Brazil. His budding congregation was believing for a permanent facility. And at that same time, the authorities in his city came to him and offered and presented to him that he could have a piece of land for his church building under one condition that they actually began construction the very next day. Well, he didn't have funds, but he and the church just began to pray and believe God. And on that same day, he got word and news that a Northwoods family decided to fund him in his church, giving him the exact funds that he needed to begin construction. It's really a miracle, and they began to build a church. I also think of another recent Northwoods church plant, uh, Pastor Chai Mob, who is planting a church in Cambodia, a country literally where only 2% of the population has been Christianized at all. He was planting a church in a small village called Tomnab, and in that village, as he was evangelizing, the village chief came to him and said that he was experiencing some significant lower back pain. Well, he just began to pray for that village chief, and instantaneously, God performed a miracle, completely alleviated the pain, and the most influential person in the village, the village chief now, has been touched and had an encounter with Jesus, opening the doors wide to the whole village. And in fact, he hasn't just been evangelizing his village that he's planning a church in, but he's been going to neighboring villages, doing the work of evangelism, and reporting back that the hearts of the people are just so open to the gospel. So you really are making a genuine impact on the world. And I just wanted to tell you, thank you, thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts, hear from your family at The Surge Project. Is that awesome, guys? Holy cow. I'm watching that the other day, tears welling up in my eyes. And I'm like, God, thank you that you're allowing us here from Peoria, Illinois, to touch places all over the world. Can you imagine that church? I want to meet that guy in Cambodia one day. There's a church meeting there because you believe God and you trusted him and you got behind what he's about. Starts with communion and then petition and then intercession and real quickly we'll be done. I want you to move up to this next one. It's called declaration. There comes a time when you've been in God's presence, you've been believing him for some things in intercession or in petition, you've been believing him for some things in intercession, and there is a place where you move up into declaration and you just start speaking it with your mouth because you know it has come from the heart of God, you know it's based in the word of God, and you know that it's what God wants done, and you declare it done. It's what Jesus taught us in that powerful prayer passage from Mark 11. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. I believe Job's friends understood this. Look at this passage, Job chapter 22, verses 23 and 26 to 28. It says, if you remove wickedness from your tent. Now, Job's friends were accusing him of wickedness, and that's why this is coming in. That wasn't true. But nonetheless, this prayer principle is true. If you remove wickedness from your tent, look at this, then you will have your delight in the Almighty and lift up your, your face to God. You will make your prayer to him and he will hear you. Now watch this. You will declare a thing. 
You will declare it because you have God's heart. And it will be established for you. So light will shine on your ways. You will declare a thing. It will be done for you. So guys, as you've been communing with God, you've moved in petition, intercession, sometimes you'll be so convinced of the will of God that you'll start declaring it in Jesus' name. It'll sound something like this. God, I lift these 3,000 churches before you. I now declare in Jesus' name that they be planted. I bind all enemy opposition that stands in the way. I loose your kingdom power over there in Cambodia, in China, in Iraq, in Iran. I release your kingdom power, Lord, there in North Korea. God, we pray in the 2.5 million for making this happen. We declare that all obstacles be removed and that your miraculous provision be released in Jesus' name. See, with the declarative prayer, you go right into the throne room of heaven and from the perspective of the Father and with his word on your heart, you send laser-like declarations right into villages, right into communities, right into nations all around the world and into situations that need to be changed here in your world. Stand in front of the mountain and in the name of Jesus, tell it to move. You take up the word of God on your lips and address situations in the name of Jesus that God has put on your heart. And guys, you will release a power surge for the kingdom of God. So as you take your prayer card, as you leave here in a minute, make a commitment to coming into God's presence these next 21 days Set aside time. The great people of the world are the people who pray. They don't have time, they gotta set it aside from something else. Set aside time to commune with God. Yes, petition him. Then stand in the gap for other people. But make your declarations then based on the word of God. And I believe that we will see an amazing power surge. Again, I want to pray for you right now. I want to pray for everybody at all the campuses. Campus pastors, you can make your way up front right now. And they're going to let you guys know at your campuses what maybe the specific need is that you can be praying for at your campus through this kingdom surge. Would you stand with me right now? I want to just bless you and pray for you as we go. And so, Lord, your word says in James 5.16 that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I thank you, God, that clothed in the righteousness of Jesus and walking in the righteousness through the power of the Holy Spirit, nothing, nothing, nothing can hinder our prayers that we make in the mighty name of Jesus that are consistent with his will. And I pray release a surge of your power to bring about your vision for our lives and for our church in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray it. Everybody agreed with this prayer and said, amen. amen. Come on, give him a clap praise today. Thank you for being here. Hope to see you back next week, but pick up your card and let's pray for that power surge. If you need prayer for anything, you come on down. The prayer team will be here to meet you as well. Go see John and Susie over in the student center, all right? <laughs> Those of you watching online, thank you so much for being with us again today. I'm told by the guys that are hosting you that there's a way for you to get the prayer card as well. We'd love wherever you're coming from to unite your heart with us for the next 21 days. Pray that God will release a power search. God bless you guys, and I'll look forward to seeing you again next week.